Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition number 40 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for uh, January 19th to 25th, 2012. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things that are important to me and that I think deserve to be important to you as well. Uh, as always, comments, questions, reactions can be addressed directly to me. My email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you missed that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere a couple of times during the show. Uh, the only thing I ask, I do answer my mail. The only thing I ask, though, is that if you do write to me, that in the subject line you say something like your show or left side of the aisle or something like that so that I know it's not spam. All right, there's a couple of things we're going to talk about today. I've got to jam these in. Uh, the first one is something I've talked about before, but I feel it's necessary to talk about it again. The Social Security system is under attack. Now, the immediate threat to the system has been pushed back, um, largely because the Occupy movement has been successful in forcing our politicians to spend more time, at least rhetorically, addressing issues like unemployment and income disparity, rather than screeching about the deficit, the deficit, the deficit all the time. However, the groundwork for the next wave of attacks is already being set. Um, by, by laying the groundwork, I mean, this is the practice of like preparing the way, of trying to establish premises, uh, establishing them by repeating them over and over and over again until nobody challenges them anymore and they're just accepted without question or the need for any explanation. Uh, by the way, too, right here, right now, I want this mentioned very clearly. All the talk about Social Security, uh, all the... All the things about cutting it back or even dismantling it, they all talk about future, the future case, the future retirees, that it won't affect anybody who's retired or approaching retirement age. I say, want to say that here because I want to make it clear that what I'm telling you is not about me. None of this affects me. This is about you. And I'm bringing it up because the attacks on Social Security are lies. Now, what sort of lies? Well, it goes back to that uh, laying of the groundwork that I just mentioned, the establishing of false presumptions. That's the same sort of thing we saw in the run-up to the Iraq War when we saw it pounded. WMDs, uh, imminent threats, Saddam equals Al-Qaeda equals Saddam, repeated over and over and over and over and over until no one, or at least not enough people, even questioned these premises anymore, even though they all turned out to be false. In the case of uh, Social Security, the establishment of these premises can be summed up in a headline I saw the other day on the splash screen on America Online. I'm quoting this headline. The grim reality for Social Security. The fund will go belly up by 2036, but you don't have to. If you start now, you can retire comfortably even when it's gone. Four things you can do to avoid the collapse. So in one headline, we've got grim reality, go belly up, it's gone, the collapse. The article to which this headline linked started by saying, and I'm quoting again, Social Security's trust fund is in the process of collapsing. And in that first paragraph, goes on to claim that many prominent political and investment figures have called Social Security a Ponzi scheme. In the course of this article, it uses phrases... Uh, when the trust fund empties, when the trust fund vanishes, when the trust fund is gone, you like that one, you use it four times, uh, the collapse of the trust fund, it's running out of money, the trust fund's in trouble. These kind of persistent over and over and over again claims are having an effect. Uh, according to a survey done by the AARP in 2010, only 25% uh, of people aged 30 to 49 feel confident about the future of Social Security. But it's lies. I mean, it's, it's, it's lies. I mean, for one thing, calling it a Ponzi scheme, I, in fact, going back a step before that, the assertion that many prominent uh, leaders and investment people have called it a Ponzi scheme is nonsense. It's been called that by a handful of right-wing hacks and their fat cat backers who want to see the whole system collapse because they don't see it benefiting them personally. 
And calling it a Ponzi scheme, now you know what a Ponzi scheme is. This is one of these deals where you convince somebody to invest in some thing or another. Um, and then you get a couple more investors and you use those investors investments to pay the first group of investors. So they say, oh, what a great scheme this was. Look at the profits they're making. That promotes more investors who used to pay off the second rank and you get more and more investors, you taking a cut each step of the way until finally you reach a point where there aren't any more investors to be found and the whole thing collapses. This is an illegal scam. To call Social Security an illegal scam is it's absurd. It's a lie. It's just a bull. It, 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 I mean, it's beyond saying that it's incorrect. It's beyond saying that's misleading. It is a flaming fat lie. What's more, the claims about that it's going belly up, it's collapsing, it's going to vanish, those are all lies. They're all lies. The trust fund is not going to run dry in 2036, about or about 25 years from now, that is. Um, what's going to disappear or what's going to run dry in 2036. That's is assuming, by the way, that the rather gloomy economic predictions of the Social Security trustees prove to be accurate. What's going to be gone is the surplus. This is a surplus that was built up consciously and deliberately for the purpose of dealing with the um, baby boomer demographic bulge that everybody knew was coming. For most of its history, Social Security has been pay as you go current retirees being supported by current workers based on the promise that when those workers get old, they will in turn be supported. It's a social promise that we've made to ourselves. And the thing is, all the horrified cries about it going belly up in 2036 really mean that the system will go back to the pay-as-you-go status it is existent on for most all of its history. And Social Security is not in that bad shape. It really isn't. I mean, we keep hearing about the projected shortfall. Now, this is over 75 years into the future. That's as far out as the Social Security trustees will make projections. We keep hearing about the hundreds of billions, the trillions of dollars. I mean, B's and T's get thrown around like a Scrabble box gone berserk. But there's no context for any of these. So here's one comparison for you. Uh, the... Bush-era tax cuts for the richest 2% of Americans, just those people, never mind the rest of us, those people, making that tax cut permanent and continuing it out over that 75-year period will have a cost of about 0.7% of GDP, gross domestic product. The projected shortfall for Social Security over that same period is 0.8% of GDP. You cannot rationally say that the former we can afford and the latter is economic disaster. It's just not possible. Uh, in fact, the arguments about Social Security going belly up in 2036 fail on their own terms because even those people will admit that, according to the projections, in 2036, the Social Security system will still be able to pay about 75% of projected benefits. And that is if we do absolutely nothing at all to preserve or uphold the system. And what's more, there's something very rarely explained about those 75% of projected benefits. Expected means projected. These are projected benefits based on projections of inflation and income. The thing is, your benefits are indexed to inflation, but your initial benefits are based on how much money you have made. And the fact is, over a period of decades, means basically over the working life of an average person, wages tend to rise a little faster than inflation, which means the real value of initial Social Security benefits tends to go up year after year. The bottom line here is that 75% of projected benefits in 2036 is about the same in real terms as current initial benefits are now. Put another way, and remember this is if we do absolutely nothing to support the system, retirees in 2036 would have about the same standard of living from Social Security as people retiring today do. Now being able to provide the same standard of living 25 years from now 
hardly seems to me an accurate description of a system that is going belly up. The fact is, it's a lie. It's a lie. Now, Social Security has had any number of tweaks over its lifetime. Any number of tweaks over its lifetime. We probably have to tweak it a little bit more. Um, but the thing is that if Social Security is not available to you when you retire, it will not be because of failure of the system. It will not be because of failure of Social Security. It will be because a handful of selfish fat cats managed to have enough economic power to strip away from you the promise that America has made to its retirees for the last 75 years, and by 2036 they have made that promise for over 100 years. It will have been their decision to break that promise. And by the way, what can we do to save Social Security? Simplest thing, best thing, you want to protect Social Security out to that 75 years and beyond? Remove the cap on income subject to Social Security wages. Let the rich pay their share. All right. Now we're moving on from there. It is time for the outrage of the week. Last week, January 11th, Mayor Jerry Sanders of San Diego gave his State of the City address. And watching this is really kind of a, a weird. It was this huge auditorium. There are hundreds of people there. There was a giant twirling graphic of the city's seal. There was rock music playing when he came in. It was, the whole thing was really kind of weird. Well, anyway, at the beginning of the speech, he was mic-checked by some Occupy protesters. Now, you know what mic-checking is. You know, somebody gouts mic-check, mic-check, and then people repeat this with the idea that then, you know, it's a lot of people saying the same thing at the same time so that your voices can be heard without the need for amplification. It's intentionally disruptive but it's entirely peaceful, and it's been used in any number of times. I mean, the CEO of Wells Fargo was mic-checked. Representatives of J.P. Morgan Chase were mic-checked. Uh, Newt Grinch has been mic-checked. Even President Hopi Changey himself has been mic-checked. But God forbid you should do it to the exalted mayor of San Diego. Not content to escort the protesters out of the hall, not content even to arrest the four that um, refused to stop, the city has charged those four with felony conspiracy. They now face two years in prison for what's usually a simple misdemeanor. A conspiracy is known in the trade as the prosecutor's darling because unlike most crimes, hearsay is allowed as evidence Evidence against any one conspirator is considered evidence against all of them as a group. And proof of conspiracy doesn't require that any overt crime was actually committed. Because the crime here is the plan to uh, commit a crime, not any actual crime itself. According to the classic example, a boy steals a candy, he's committed a misdemeanor. Two boys plan to steal candy, but don't do it. They've conspired, which is a felony. And as here, this prosecutor's darling can also be used to escalate a minor annoyance into a threat of a two-year prison sentence. And the thing is, this is not the only case of over-the-top charges in an attempt to suppress the Occupy movement. On January 12th, during Los Angeles's bi-weekly art walk, a German named Adam Alders stepped off the curb. It's crowded, the sidewalk was very crowded, and he stepped off the curb into the street. He was immediately swarmed and arrested by police. Now, an Occupy uh, participant named Sergio Ballesteros, he objected to the arrest and found himself under arrest and charged with lynching. Yes, lynching. California lynching law dates from 1933. It was designed to protect defendants from vigilante justice, especially black defendants against racist mobs. Lynching is defined as the taking by means of a riot of any person from the lawful custody of any uh, a peace officer, where riot is defined as two or more people threatening violence or disturbing the peace. It carries a four-year prison sentence. Now, there was no riot here. 
Um, and there weren't even two people. I mean, who was the second? This is a trumped up charge for the political purpose of trying to break the Occupy movement, at least in California, by massively raising the potential stakes for any protesters. And that's particularly clear since this wasn't the first time this happened. An Occupy Oakland protester was arrested on a charge of lynching back on December 30th. Minor crimes, even no crimes, twisted into felonies for the purpose of suppressing political dissent. It's not new. I mean, if you want to know about conspiracy trials, check out the 60s. We had a boatload of them. But the fact is, it is still outrageous. In fact, it's the outrage of the week. We know we're going to take about a 15-second break here just to remind you of who and what's going on, and then we will be right back. And we're back. Uh, this past Monday was uh, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, Martin Luther King is probably the prime example of the adage that we Americans praise our military warriors when they are alive and our nonviolent warriors only when they are safely dead. And make no mistake, that's what he was. He was a warrior and a revolutionary. A nonviolent warrior, a nonviolent revolutionary to be sure, but still, he was a warrior and a revolutionary. And despite all the banal platitudes you may have heard if you watched any formal observances on Monday, and despite all the truly bizarre attempts by the right wing to claim he was actually one of them, he was a warrior and a revolutionary, and don't you forget it. Last year, a year ago on my blog, uh, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, I wrote about Martin Luther King. I, I actually wrote about how I can still get teary when I watch a video of the last speech he gave, the one he gave in Memphis the night before he was killed. If you haven't seen this speech, look it up on YouTube. You can find it. Watch it. Now, I don't get teary easily, as anybody that knows me can tell you. I'm no John Boner, Boehner, whatever. Um, but I don't get teary easily. But I can still get teary when I look at that video and I think about how far we have come in the decades since his death and how far we have not. Uh, in December, anti-Semitic graffiti was spray painted on a synagogue in Maywood, New Jersey, and another one in Hackensack, New Jersey. On the evening of January 1st, uh, four buildings, Jamaica, Queens, uh, in New York, and another in the nearby town of Elmont, including a Hindu house of worship and a uh, Muslim uh, community center and mosque, were firebombed, all within the space of two hours. Police in New York are said to be considering the possibility that these attacks were linked. On January 3rd, someone tried to burn down a synagogue in Paramus, New Jersey. On January 11th, the synagogue in Rutherford, New Jersey, was hit by several Molotov cocktails. Police, again, were said to be considering the possibility that they were linked. Considering the possibility? I mean, first, I think all of these attacks are linked. Now, the thing is, um, we're going to bring a graphic up here. Going to bring a graphic up. Uh, just to give, because just to give you, I mean, I know, you don't know where Maywood, New Jersey is, okay? Uh, so I brought up this graphic just to give you an idea. This is an image taken from Google Earth. Now, to orient you to this image, Manhattan is right in the middle of the screen. Uh, the Hudson River runs from the top center down towards the lower left. Long Island goes from the lower center of the screen off to the right, in fact, you know, beyond the edge of the, of the image. And um, eastern metropolitan New Jersey is to the left side of the image, okay? Now, I've marked these locations. I've marked Paramus, Maywood, Hackensack, and Rutherford in New Jersey. I've marked the Jamaica, Queens area of New York, which is the site, again, of four attacks, and of Elmont, also in New York. In airline miles, the farthest distance between the, any of these two points is between Paramus and Elmont. It's about 25 miles. None of these places is more than an hour or at the most a 90-minute bus ride from any other. So we're going to take that image down now. Um, the thing is, forget the graffiti for a moment, okay? Just forget the graffiti. 
In the space of 11 days, there were six fire bombings and a case of arson, with targets including two synagogues, a Hindu house of worship, and a Muslim community center and mosque, all within a circle with a radius of a little more than a dozen miles. And cops suspect a connection? I mean, how common are fire bombings in that part of the world? I mean, let's face facts. Bigotry, hatred of all sorts, racial, ethnic, religious, the list goes on. Bigotry and hatred are alive and well in the United States. And we see it everywhere in things big and small. In Georgia, a grade school had some math word problems that included winners like these. And I'm quoting here, each tree had 56 oranges. If eight slaves picked them equally, then how much would each slave pick? And if Frederick got two beatings per day, how many would he get in one week? Meanwhile, in New York City, on Upper Broadway in Manhattan, a clerk at a Papa John's pizzeria described a customer on her receipt as Lady Chinky Eyes. And Microsoft, by the way, they have a new app for GPS devices. It's called the Avoid Ghetto app. And we see it not only in cases like that, we see it in our misleaders. Uh, Newt Grinch, the man who previously talked about the glories of five-year-old poor black children cleaning school toilets, told a white town hall earlier this month that he would go to the NAACP and explain why blacks should demand uh, paychecks, not food stamps. The necessary premises for that statement being black folks pr prefer not working, that is, they're lazy, that blacks are the ones who get food stamps, even though the vast majority of food stamp people are white, and that it's either work or food stamps, that is, you can't work and still qualify. Meanwhile, uh, Rick, I should be in a sanitarium, told a mostly white audience in Sioux City, Iowa recently, that public assistance programs like food stamps were intended to get more and more blacks dependent on government in order to keep their votes. And now he doesn't want to make uh, black people's lives better by giving them somebody else's money, but by giving them the opportunity to go out and earn the money. Again, the necessary assumptions are only black people get food stamps, even though according to CBS News, only 9% of food stamp recipients in Iowa are black, um, and black people don't work. Now, Ricky Boy denied he said black, claiming, and I'm quoting him, I started to say a word and then sort of change it, and it sort of blah came out. Now, no one asks Mr. More Godly than thou uh, just what appropriate word beginning with B he intended to say. So I guess we have to accept that, according to um, I should be in a sanitarium. It's not black people who are living off somebody else's money. It's all those blah people. And the problem goes beyond these, these individual cases and these individual examples because the real problem is how willing so many people are to accept uh, and even approve of this sort of bigotry. A spokesman for the school in Georgia said the teachers were just trying to incorporate social studies lessons into math and they didn't mean any harm. An assistant manager at the Popper John's Pizzeria said, oh, it didn't mean any harm, but, you know, but yeah, some people might find that offensive. Yeah, ain't it always the way how those people find it so offensive. They're so touchy, man. I mean, lady chinky eyes. Who could object to that? Just, you know, some people. I recall some years ago objecting to a joke, a so-called joke, that involved the word nigger in the punchline, only to be told that how it was so sad that I couldn't see the lighter side of life. I was just so sensitive. An online poll, according to an online poll, 88% of the respondents to that poll said the Avoid Ghetto app is not racist, uh, even though the crime statistics are based at least in part on demographics and in fact tell you absolutely nothing about the risks of driving through that neighborhood. When Juan Williams tried to challenge Grinch's racist ass uh, assertions in the very mild way of asking if couldn't he understand how this could seem offensive, the overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly Christian audience, and I can say the latter because South Carolina is overwhelmingly Christian, in fact, it's 50% evangelical, they booed him so loudly you couldn't hear the question. 
And Grinch said, oh, that's not offensive. It was up to him to decide what another group of people find offensive. What's more, he said, he went on to say that he was going, apparently personally, he was going to continue to find ways to help poor people learn how to get a job. Poor people here, as everyone understood, and as he essentially admitted after the debate was over, uh, meant poor black people. So, in effect, Grinch is saying that poor black people do not know how to work, and it's up to him to teach them. This blatant racism got Grinch a standing ovation from the yahoos and rednecks in that hall. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised because this is the same crowd that booed Ron Paul when he mentioned the golden rule. Oh, and by the way, those folks can't possibly object to the fact that I called them yahoos and rednecks because, well, I admit that some people might find that offensive, but I didn't mean any harm. And, and so don't be so politically correct. Don't be so sensitive. The fact is, it's past time we stop playing nice with the bullies and bigots. Um, Bigotry spans all sorts of, of, of borders of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual preference, age, religion, nationality. In fact, if you doubt that, that same audience booed the very mention of the nation of Mexico. And you really want to get a reaction, tell some Republican they look French. It's time we called out the bigots for what they are. Because until we're willing to do that, the sort of casual, everyday bigotry, the sort of approval of bigotry, that we've seen so recently will continue to pollute and poison our society. And as a footnote to all that, a quarter of all Americans and a third of all white evangelicals say they'd be less likely to support a candidate who's Mormon. At least as far as I know, no Mormon houses of worship have been firebombed yet. All right, I'm running short of time. Got about a minute and a half, I suppose. So I... I Something I want to stick in real quick here. SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, is now described as being on life support. I talked about this bill before. I expect I'll have more to say about it next week. But there was a massive web-based protest on Wednesday, the 18th. It was a go dark action. Some big sites, including Reddit, Mozilla, the uh, Wikipedia in English, WordPress, Move On, Two Cows, Boing Boing, uh, and some 7,000 other sites went dark. Craigslist, Google, and Wired also engaged in their own form of protest. Um, the White House has come out in opposition to at least some aspects of the bill. And there's been a, been a Republican rebellion against the bill. Four senators today, uh, on Wednesday, rather, Wednesday the 18th, four senators announced that they had changed their minds and they're going to oppose the bill. One of the people who said they're going to vote oppose it, our own Scott Brown actually said he's going to vote against the Senate version of the bill and he'll vote against the House version if it gets there. The fact is, we're winning on this. We're winning on this one. Um, and I'll have more on this um, on, on Occupy Congress. The Occupy Congress actions that are going on this week, I'll have more on that as well next week. So that's it. I'm about out of time. Um, you just have the best week you can. Um, and I will see you next week. Uh, and until then, go for it. <laughs>